Your call has been forwarded to an automatic voice message system. Matt Horn is not available. At the tone, please record your message. When you have finished recording, you may hang up or press 1 for more options. 3, 2, 1. Empezamos en dos minutos. Silencio, por favor. Existe un estereotipo que la gente mexicana somos muy sentimentales. ¿Qué haces con la gente que te cae mal? Sí, pero él no dijo eso. A ver, a ver, a ver. Que tienes que conectar real, güey. Hello, hello. Pick up, pick up. One, two, three. Did you watch me in Mexico yet? This is Hannah Jaff. Hello. Uh, he's not picking up. This is Hannah Jaff. Hello. From Made in Mexico. So, on the line, we have Hannah Jaff talking to us from... Where are you talking to us from, Hannah? I'm actually London. Really? Yes. That's quite nice. Yes. What are you doing over here? Well, actually, I came to celebrate my birthday because in two hours, three hours, it's my birthday. Oh, happy birthday. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, I flew in to spend the weekend here with some friends. So, this is where I spend my holidays. Mm. Do you like it? I love it. I love it. I absolutely adore it. Yes, it's uh, one of a kind. Sort of like, for me, London is sort of the capital of the world. Everyone from the whole world's here. Sort of like a water hole. Everyone stops here for some reason, even if you're not from here. So, I love it. Now, Hannah. Yes. I am sure that you probably don't know this, but I am politically neutral on these podcasts. Yes. Okay. Basically, I thought, what's the best sort of way to get into this interview? I mean, I feel completely out of my depth with this, where we're going, because obviously it's a it's a reality TV series, which, which we'll talk about uh, in a bit. Okay. As a starting point, I wanted to talk to you really about your thoughts on this Mexico border that Trump's got. Right. I mean, obviously this is news that's currently going on at the minute. I mean, supposedly Trump sending fifteen thousand soldiers, Troops. Yes. yeah, to this this Mexico border. What are your thoughts on that? Well, um, I'm always been um, against walls because I grew up in San Diego and Tijuana. I've always seen sort of that situation from very close to me. Um, I've volunteered in shelter homes, and the story behind every immigrant is. Is very uh, touching to anyone that has been close to it because some people don't realize that many people that want to immigrate to the States is because they're running away from poverty or they're running away from violence and they just want to look for an opportunity to work and be able to sustain their families back home or for a better life. And these walls are separating families, not letting them in legally, just in order for them to work is becoming an issue because there's all this illegal people crossing and many of them obviously have been through tragic situations uh, like, you know, starving or getting lost or kids not being able to see their parents again because of, you know, not being able to go back and forth. So it's devastating for, for Mexicans to hear these stories because most of them, that well, at least the ones I've been close to, and that's a lot of people, a lot of immigrants, are just looking for an opportunity to work. And I was just last week at the Guatemala-Mexico border, and I was speaking to so many uh, people from Honduras, and they were just saying, you know, there's no, there's no work in Honduras. All we want to do is get a job. And they were hoping to be able to get to the U.S. in order to find a job. And many of them don't have papers, and they're going to look for asylum. And, well, many Mexicans have been able to give them a job, actually. Some of them have been actually staying in states, in the central states of Mexico as well. But it really is tragic, a very tragic situation, especially because I'm Mexican, and I've been very close to hearing these stories. And it's a tragedy, you know, separating families. Many people are just looking for a better opportunity, you know, the their current situation is far worse, you know, than walking an entire country, not well, not just Mexico, also Guatemala, in order to find a better life. So it's very sad. 
very, very sad. Mm. So I think that one of the things that we all need is awareness, you know, why they're coming there. And most of the people that I spoke to are just trying to find a better, a better job, you know, an opportunity to be able to feed their families. Mm. I mean, you hear in the news, I mean, certainly in the last year or so, you've heard in the news about terrible things like, you know, they're, they're right. separating children from their families. They're um, locking them up. Yes. Yeah. They're, being uh, held in holding cells, you know, it's it's really, it's not fair, you know, and, and the only thing their parents or the kids want is, you know, peace, you know, live somewhere where they can go to school and have a proper education and, you know, a proper job, employment, and in their current countries, they can't do that, so for me, it's like, I'm all about we are one and we are human and let everyone in, and uh, unfortunately, the current uh, administration government is not pro that, so I'm a very big activist for it. So it's very, it's very tragic. Mm. And then there's this stupid comment that some orange person made on right. the news the the other week that said, or was it a couple of days ago? I, I don't really know. Where he About said that the, the rocks, born citizens. no, more mm-hmm. the rocks. The rocks was the worrying one. Um, I right. thought. If the migrants throw rocks, we're going to shoot them. What? You know. I was with the caravan, walking with them. Mm. And I actually um, got an opportunity to sleep um, two nights at uh, Tapachula. That's a city in um, Chiapas, the state right where you crossed uh, Guatemala with Mexico. And, I mean, these people are harmless. They're just, you know, most of them are just hungry. You know, they're just desperate to find uh, a better place to live in. So it's very tragic, you know. I think people don't realize how how many people need help and we should all give other people a hand, you know. Just because they're not American, it doesn't mean, you know, we're not related. We're all humans in the end of the day. So that's what I'm trying to get out there, mm. spread that message. Would you say that part of the problem is ignorance? I grew up in a family where my father's Muslim, Kurdish, and I've been in refugee camps. And... I've heard similar stories. A refugee has a very similar situation to with an immigrant. And my mother is Mexican, and she's been very close to helping immigrants. So when I tell stories here in London about it, for instance, or when I'm in the States, in New York, or San Diego, or wherever I might be, people just don't know because they they didn't grow up with it, or they're not around it, and they don't have that empathy towards it, you know? It's sort of like when you hear a story so far away from you maybe I don't know something going on in Australia and if I've never been there and I don't have an Aussie friend or I don't have someone telling me about it well you kind of don't feel anything towards it because you're not aware of the situation so I think one of the main reasons the reasons why I've been a conference speaker in, in many universities is because many people at the end of my conference were like thank you for telling me because I've never even heard about this situation. You know, I, I wasn't living in the border or I don't live in the states where immigrants walk through or in a border town. So many people don't don't know, you know, so I recommend everyone to, you know, be aware of the situation because I kid you not, if you step a day at a shelter home or speak with an immigrant or spend a day at a refugee camp, I don't think anyone, after hearing multiple stories and multiple situations, uh, will be against it. There's absolutely no way. If you spend one day, an afternoon, an hour just listening to children, mothers, you know, men, you know, elderly, hearing about what their intentions are and what their past is, I kid you not, I think everybody would help a brother out, you know? Hmm. Well... Obviously, with with everything you've said in mind, obviously we get onto your your Netflix series made in Mexico. Right. It's a reality TV series. I think we can fairly say say that. What sort of message are you trying to put across for those who haven't obviously watched it? My dream was never to be in acting or in uh, shows or any of that sort. I'm I'm a I'm a humanitarian. In the end of the day. I've lived in Europe a lot and in the States, and every time I say I'm Mexican, not every time, but many times, I have had sort of a negative feedback about it, and I constantly have to justify or defend my roots or where I'm from, 
because people will be like have a stereotype about Mexicans or going to Mexico, which is actually um, not true or not not 100 percent true, you know. So when I was approached by uh, Netflix and Made in Mexico, they told me we're going to show a different side of Mexico that everybody's not, not used to seeing, you know, because usually on TV you get to see all this, you know, cartels and violent shows about Mexico and usually it's the worst. And obviously that does go on in our country, but it's not every it's not it's not everything about our country. And when they told me that if you want to be a part of a show where you can show another a beautiful part of Mexico, our our beautiful city, our our beautiful traditions like the Day of the Dead, for instance, our, you know, family values, you know, that we have a a career, you know, work lives, that we have passions that we have hobbies you know so I was like sure I want to be a part of it because I constantly have to prove that Mexico is great you know and that's the main reason why I wanted everyone to see this side of Mexico and actually I've gotten positive feedback out of it because many people after seeing it were booking their flights to Mexico they were like I can't believe that's the capital you know it's so beautiful say for example I went to Mexico yes Hmm. which I hope you do Obviously. <laughs> what would you advise me doing on a holiday? Oh, my. Well, okay. First mm. of all, I'm going to have to send you a list of, like, museums. And Teotihuacan is the city of the Aztecs, the pyramids. And you have to visit, like, there's amazing restaurants. The food there is to die for. Like, gourmet, like, top-of-the-notch restaurants. If you think you've tried Mexican food in London, you haven't. The Mexican food in the States is not the same at all. You know, uh, you'll find the best tacos, the best chilaquiles, the best music, you know. And right now, actually, I would recommend you go in this time because it's a holiday. Well, actually, yesterday was uh, our last day. of our, our There was festivals all over the streets for the Day of the Dead. It's a Mexican traditional holiday yesterday. And just we're very warm-blooded people. Like, I would tell you, you know, go out, you know, go to a – a uh, restaurant, go to a bar, go, I don't know, go to a museum. Everyone's so kind, you know, everyone's so helpful. Mexicans are so hard workers. Visit a beach, you know, you have beautiful beaches in Mexico. We have so many, like, Spanish colonial towns. It's, like, amazing. You know, if you go to the south, you have sort of, like, Caribbean color waters, amazing. You know, all these uh, states in the south, like Chiapas, for instance, it's all forest. It's all, like, green. It's all these canyons, it's beautiful, the ocean. Um, if you go to Quintana Roo, where Can- Cancun is, Tulum is really happening right now. It's, like, lit right now. <laughs> um, and the capital is amazing. It's sort of like a little Manhattan. It's like a little L.A. It's, it's, you know, incredible. So much history behind it. The south, you can find history, too. It's the whole Mayan history. And in the north, I would recommend you take, like, a a day like and see like haciendas and ranches and there's this other city called Monterey which is like industrial it's beautiful really it's it's such a complete country you can't just visit one city there's like 10 cities you have to go to it's amazing Mm -hmm. I do have to talk about your your um, non-profit work your Mm -hmm. charity work this is interesting because I didn't know anything about this to be honest I, I didn't even know that it was that big a thing i just speak english and you know right and people understand you created uh, the jaff foundation for education right. which the mission is basically to teach english to immigrants refugees and less fortunate right i never knew that english was such a huge predominant language but i suppose it is isn't it it is actually you know it's It's a universal language, and most of the immigrants and refugees going to a country where they want another opportunity is usually English-speaking country, or at least the second most spoken language where they go to. Since I was a kid, my mom would always help immigrants, and my dad would always help refugees. That's why I wanted to help refugees and immigrants, because the story behind it is that if I think of immigrants, it's my mom, and I think of refugees, I think of my dad. So that's the cause. And... The reason was because every time I spent time with refugees and immigrants, yes, we would feed them. Yes, we would give them clothes, we would give them blankets or whatever they might need. But one of the things was there's a lot of waiting around for them, you know. And I was thinking like, okay, so 
many of them couldn't communicate when they were there or where they were deported or they were sent back or while they were moving, you know, it was like a lot of waiting around. So I'm like, if I can give them a book, you know, so they could study on their way and get there and maybe be able to order food, uh, ask for a job and they could speak basic English and they could get around easier. I was like, why don't I give them a book? So I started going to libraries and started um, buying books that were like off the shelf. And I was like, I know how to uh, speak English and Spanish. I'll just write it myself. And this way I can get copies of it and give it away for free and have it on my website and anyone can download it. So that's what I started to do. I, uh, I started to write an English learning book for Spanish speakers. Then it was also translated for uh, Kurdish speakers, for refugees, and uh, for Purépecha speakers. It's a native Mexican language. And we've managed to give out 60,000 of them. It's not a lot, but it wasn't easy. I started on my own in 2013, this nonprofit. And one person became two volunteers, three volunteers, five volunteers. It was like a teamwork. You know, we would knock on doors and be like, can you print me 10 copies or can you print me 30 copies? And then that's how it became 60,000 today. So um, we we thought English was something that can help them on their way. And we've actually had positive feedback. You know, people have actually written us back saying that, you know, I had my book with me the whole time. And thanks to that, I could actually manage to communicate with uh, Americans or with Europeans or wherever they might be. So I'm, I'm happy with that cause. And that's sort of become our, our last five years of work giving out English books. Hmm. I yes. mean, I mean, this will sound weird to you and to anyone listening to this podcast. But I mean, I can't I can't obviously learn how to speak French or Italian anyway. without a teacher. Without, yeah, exactly. Well, actually, my book is a self-taught English book. So for instance, it's almost like a handy book. It's like you go to the index if, if they want to order a bus ticket, for instance, um, they'll go to transportation in Spanish, transportación, or in Kurdish, or in Purépecha, and they'll actually look for saying, okay, I want to buy a ticket, and it'll, it'll be like three phrases. It'll be like how you um, say it in Spanish, and then how you say it in English, and then how you pronounce it in English as if you were reading Spanish. After learning from my book, you're not going to speak fluent English. It's just something to have handy on you for moving around, getting, you know, food, getting transportation, just getting around, you know, uh, objects, numbers, colors, you know, hello, greetings, stuff like that. That's sort of what my book is for. You do need a teacher, obviously, to learn fluent English. But if you just want something to help you out as like a basic English, that's what the book is for. Because mm. I, I have friends, obviously, that teach uh, English to Chinese kids. Right. And I I have this obvious question of how hard is it to teach someone the English language? Is it harder right. than to teach them a, a foreign language like Spanish or French or Italian? Or is it quite easy given the fact it's so universal? The feedback that I've gotten, it's, it's, it's very hard because Latinos, for instance, have told me in the past that when they've learned try to learn other language it's much easier if you're trying to learn another latin language when you speak formal or informal and then past tense future present tense changes as well and then in english it's just uh there really isn't formal or informal and um with the past tense you sort of just add an ed it is difficult for a latin speaker to learn english and that's what i've heard uh i don't also think that it's easy to learn English, especially when Spanish, we have so many accents, you know, and with one accent, the whole meaning of the word can change. So it is, I mean, I'm, I'm pretty sure any language is hard to learn. Hopefully, I don't know if any of you, um, you know, people learning to speak English want to listen to this podcast and sort of understand what we're talking about. Hopefully they will. <laughs> Hopefully they can go on my website, download my book for free, jazzfoundation.com, go to books and you'll see my free books. Is that also a way of volunteering as well? Yes, you just contact us. So right now we have 7,000 active volunteers. In Mexico, we're in 18 states. In the U.S., we're in three states. But anyone can volunteer, donate. Actually, one of our volunteers in Purépecha was the one that translated the Purépecha version, the whole thing. She, um, she actually said, you know, I saw your book. Um, let me help out. It's all a teamwork. The NGO is, like, amazing. 
we've done around 200 events, helped around 120,000 people, donated 60,000 books, and it's all been based on volunteers. It's beautiful. Like, I think the most beautiful thing behind an NGO is, is the team behind it. So if anyone wants to become a volunteer, they can go on jazzfoundation.com, contact us, and just tell us where you are. Many of them, uh, our volunteers are also teachers, English teachers, and they actually use the book as a guide. So that's been nice too. So anyone that wants to join can join. Mm. I left this question until last. Okay. Mm. Do you think we'll ever get to a stage where there'll be absolutely no conflict whatsoever? Oh, I hope so, and I think that, that we will. I mean, we just need awareness. It might sound naive of me, but I, I truly believe in that there could. You know, we just need everyone. You know, if, if one person uh, changes and one person helps, I think two, three, four. It's sort of like this NGO that I started. I, it, it, it's, I, use it, I like to use it as an example because this is how it happened to me. You know, people got involved because it was awareness. People heard about it, and then another one wanted to join, and then another, and then another, you know. So I think if we could all find in our hearts peace, I mean, no one's born hating, right? No one's born being racist or discriminating. We can all disagree. I mean, we can all learn to agree. You know, it's fine to disagree as long as, as, long as we all respect each other. That's mainly my, my uh, We Are One campaign. So anyone that doesn't want to join We Are One or World Peace, I mean, it's fine. But don't hurt anybody else, I guess is my point. That's uh, that's sort of what I truly believe in, and I really hope that there is uh, world peace one day. Mm. Hopefully within our lifetime. I really hope so. I mean, we can only hope. Mm. But we really have to uh, work on that awareness and sort of, you know, joining other people to get involved as well. Well, I'm going to give you a one-minute plug, Hannah, to plug uh, Made in Mexico and anything else you've got coming up. Okay, great. So we are one campaign. It's a clothing line. It's um, it's basically a non-discrimination world movement, and they can go on my website, weareonecampaign.com. It's a clothing line with a message. Anything you might believe in, believe in. It's uh, no bullying, no wars, no bans, no walls. Anything that you might support in sexual orientation, people with disabilities, with sicknesses. At the end of the day, you can find so many causes on my We Are One campaign. And if you buy a t-shirt, we donate an item to a refugee or immigrant. So hopefully people can check that out. And also, I think that if by wearing um, a t-shirt with a message, other people can see it and maybe, you know, read more into it. So that's, uh, that's nice, you know, if you dress with a message. Also, if you want to read more of my work, hannahjaff.com you can see my bio my cv the work we've done before and jafffoundation.com as well if you want to join um our ngo there's no fees or anything like that you just need to go online and sort of just say what you want to do and volunteer and watch made in mexico oh don't forget watch made in mexico and hopefully you'll visit mexico someday hmm. well hannah it's been a pleasure interviewing you thank you so much for having me thanks very much for your time you too. Bye. Thanks. Bye-bye, Hannah.